hearing uh, Bo's story, Alan leaned over me and he says, I think you've been upstaged. But I'll be honest with you, everything shared this morning, I couldn't have scheduled everything shared this morning any more perfect. Uh, the words I just wrote down real quickly of the song we just heard, help me find the way to bring me back to you. That's the theme of our talk today, at one again. And um, have, have y'all ever had to do a book report for school? Well, I was just curious. I'm trying to bring back into my memory, what class was that when you would have to do a book report? Was that English class? Is, that, is it most likely an English class? Okay, so the purpose of a book report is to inspire others to read a book, right? I mean, it's supposed to be that. It's not, well, I got this out of it, and that's that. But, you know, you should... Everybody said, you know, that sounds like a pretty cool book. I want to get into that one. And uh, occasionally, you hear about a book. Somebody doesn't have to give you a report, but they say, you need to get this book. It's really life-transforming, okay? So today, that would be my prayer, that you consider a particular book, and after today's sharing together, that actually you want to say, I'm going to go home this afternoon and read that book. Does that, that sound practical about your... Okay, so today my report is going to be quite unusual. I'm going to draw my report on the board. So I'm in front of the class, and I'm drawing my report. Now, the thing is that um, some of you are saying, Oh, goodness, Pastor, I've been in school all week long. Right, Faith? And hope. And I could keep going with all the young ones. Hey, no, wait a minute. You guys had two, guy, two days off of school, didn't you? Man, yeah, five total counting Monday holiday. Yeah, they're all shouting hallelujah. So we didn't have to go for five whole days. This is, boy, this is great. Okay, so here's your, uh, I got to ask, let's see. Johnny, you taught math, right? You didn't teach math? Who, who's a math teacher? Here. Wendell. Ah, the, the engineer. Okay, so I'm about to put up a math equation. Is this yes, no? What is this? You're not an engineer? A scientist. Okay, keep me straight. Okay, a scientist. Oh, man, this is worse. Okay. Okay, I'm about to put up a math equation, and if you see something wrong with it, raise your hand, okay? So here we go. Okay, so I've got, I've got a bracket going here, or these are parentheses, right? Yeah, okay. Another set of parentheses. You've got an equal signs, a plus sign, a, uh, another group here. See, I need another plus sign here. I need this right here. I need this right here. See, one, two, three. I'm running out of room. This is not working out. Okay, so here we go. I'll make these a little smaller. Uh, another plus sign. And this, and this equals another parentheses here, okay? So, you, uh, how many sets of parentheses have I got here? One, two, three, four, five, six. This one's pathetic, isn't it? Down here at the end, okay. But I got an equal signs here, plus, 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 and an equal. Okay, any mathematician wanna say, what's weird about this? Two, what, what's the issue? Two equal signs. Well, we're dealing with God. What do you expect? Okay. Okay, two equal signs. So, okay, let me see if I got another color of marker here. Because I want to... Oh, 
Here it is. Eh, praise the Lord. Okay, so that means because of the equal signs, what's in between the equal signs, I want to emphasize. Now, what are these called? These are brackets. So we got these brackets here that I'm wanting to definitely emphasize what's in between the two brackets. And apparently, something here equals what's inside the brackets that results in it all equaling again, which would seem like, well, why don't I just put this over here and, it, and only have one set of brackets? Sounds like I'm pretty smart, doesn't it? I'm just trying to talk you into it. Okay, okay, so here, here we go. And, and I introduced this as a book in the Bible, didn't I? And I didn't say the Bible, I just said a book. Okay, so here's the book. The book of Revelation. Because the book of Revelation has a purpose. Are you counting this out for me? Am I getting it right? Explained to her. I was along the same principle, but in letter form, you know, A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D. Okay, okay. So maybe I'm not too far off with this then. Maybe some other idiot somewhere got this. No, I'm just. Okay. So, okay, here, here we go. What we're going to do is divide up the book of Revelation. I've only got 10 minutes, okay? So you're saying this is going to be really easy, huh? Because the whole purpose of the book, I'm going to go ahead and tell you the purpose of the book first. The purpose of the book is that we, through Jesus, will be back with the Father again. That I am drawn back to you. This is the purpose of the book, that it's the promise that through Jesus, we are going to be back in his presence. The fascinating thing, the way that the book begins, now this is in Revelation Revelation 1 is the illustration of how to be back in his presence was given to us by Jesus himself. Chapter 1 is a fascinating details of our Redeemer. It's all about his human side. Let's, let me just read a few verses there. Because he left all of heaven to become mankind... And as that human being revealed the Father, and the, it's just amazing the details that shared here in Revelation chapter 1. Um, uh, let's see, verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings and uh, kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us, from our sins in his blood, in his own blood, okay, and, and hath made us kings and priests unto God, unto God and his Father to be glory and dominion forever and ever. He came to set an example of how we can have a relationship with the creator of the entire universe. His prayer life was just amazing. It connected him sometimes all night long. His prayer life actually connected him all day long with his father. But he came to live out this relationship with the father. And that's why there's so many characteristics given to here, even in verses, um, say, 12 through 16, about him talking about his hair, his hands, his feet. All the, this isn't a mystic being that's being talked about. Something that's just, just light. It was share, he's sharing details. He's a human being. And yet he had such a close relationship as an example for us. We need to believe in it. There's a picture here. And I've heard of a painting, 
And I love describing this painting because that's all I can do is describe it. I would love if anybody here knows where I can download this painting on the internet, I'd love to hear it. Here's the painting. You know, when King Solomon built the tabernacle, he didn't have seven little branch candlestick. He had pillars, okay? So here's the picture of Jesus standing in the midst of the candlestick. It's amazing that terminology is used here in chapter 1, in the midst of the candlestick. Picture these pillars of fire, and they're arched. They're not just straight, they're arched. And he's standing in the midst of them. And the oil that fills those pillars, where there's areas where the, they had the leaves, uh, the olive leaf that they would pour the oil into. Well, you have these things that fill up these pillars. And for some reason, the oil is pouring out upon Jesus from these pillars. The oil is pouring out upon his head, running down his face, down his beard, and it's dripping down below. And at the foot of the painting is the earth. And the oil is dripping onto the earth. Isn't that amazing? Amazing symbolism is in this picture that this man, this God-man is being infilled with the Holy Spirit, pouring over him, and it's coming to the earth. The best way possible for Jesus to reveal how to have a relationship with God in order to be back into his presence is being told through him. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ, right? It's the way the book starts. So everything inside this brackets, everything, is for the purpose of us in these last days to reveal Jesus to a sin-sick world, right? But it's also for the purpose of teaching me how to have a relationship with God. Amen. Just like his example in Revelation 1. Just like his example in the four Gospels. Just like his example through the writers of the rest of the New Testament. How they were transformed by witnessing his example. So, anybody ready to guess what's in the first, the second bracket here? We're going to put Revelation 2 and 3, which this represents what? A particular message that we call the seven churches. Is that an E there? Yes? Is that a yes or an S? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Correct. Thank you. You'll find out from me on a board, I need help in spelling. Oh, you, oh, you've already seen it. Okay. So here, seven, the message to the seven churches. Two things, two or three things in particular, is so important. A message has been given here. From Jesus himself. He, he starts speaking in chapter 1 and continues right on through chapters 2 and 3. The message is, through him, no matter what issue you have in your life, through him, we can declare victory. We can declare he can help you overcome whatever is in your life. We can declare victory because of the red because of his shed blood because of what he did for all of mankind on the cross we can now declare victory over whatever issue you have whatever issue I have this message is so exciting and so wonderful that in Revelation chapters 4 and 5 
How do you spell seen? S S C E E N E N Seen. Okay. Worship scene. Okay. Okay. I maybe should add here. In heaven. And I'll just put an H there. Okay. So a worship huh? I didn't think it looked right. S C E N E. Anybody else? Okay. And you wonder why I asked for prayer. Okay. Okay, okay, I'm not alone. Okay, so this is a worship scene in heaven. We've been counseled to actually realize that Revelation chapter 4 and 5 are the most important two chapters in the entire Bible to understand. It's pretty amazing. So here we've got a worship scene in heaven that apparently when the Lamb comes on the scene as if he was slain, all of heaven gets excited. They're all praising God, shouting hallelujah, because the example that was, has been set forth that resulted in an overcoming message to all of mankind, all of heaven is excited because it's now in place. The way to get back to the Father is now there. It exists. It's complete. There is a, um, this is a, an illustration. Sometimes you use an illustration journey, and you're going from point A to point B. This little trip that I'm going to describe took place between A and B, okay? And now here is describing A to you, because this is describing based upon touch. It's a very unusual description, so hang with me here. Point A, pretend with me you're in the garden Jesus is encountering Mary. He has just been raised from the tomb. And he tells Mary, do not touch me because I have not ascended to my father. That's point A. Point B. He's now got Thomas by his side and he tells Thomas, Touch me. Put your hand in my side. So he tells her, no. He tells him, he can. Somewhere between A and B, something happened that has enabled Jesus to have the assurance his death was good enough. Chapter 4 and 5 is a trip to heaven because he comes on the scene as a lamb as if he was slain and the father tells him, what you did for mankind is good enough. I'm handing you the scroll. You're now in charge of everything. That's why I like considering this scroll as it has all of mankind's names in it. And you're saying, wait a minute, I wasn't even born yet. There you go, putting God in a box again. He knows. Every human being's name is in that book or in that scroll, inside and out. The seals, as they are opened, reveal the sealing process that takes place of how we choose to remain, leave our names in the scroll. You do know that, right? We choose to remove our names from the scroll by our choices. Judgment is based upon our decisions that we make. It's just not some arbitrary thing well, they're so, I only made that mansion so big. Oh, they had three extra children. I got to do something with that home. Does it work that way? That doesn't sound right at all, does it? Of course not. 
In God's mind, before we were even created, He considered us all saved. The plan was in place before we were affected by sin. Make sense? So here we've got Revelation 6. Now I need to be, I've got, got to be a little detailed here. Because the seventh seal is referred to in 8 verse 1. Okay? Are you all enjoying my book report so far? Okay, so here we go. So Revelation 6 through 8.1, that's where the seventh seal is referred to. There are some people in the Bible I like considering when I am thinking about the uh, sealing process. One guy I really love, looking forward to meeting him, and that's King Nebuchadnezzar. I'm just amazed at how he encountered God over and over again. And this is the way it's described in Daniel about how he responds to God. You know, it's like, this is my, my visual illustration. It's like he heard about this new God in town. And he, and he has somebody carve out this new stone image, and he puts him up on the shelf with the other gods that he's, he's, uh, he's wanting to cover his bases. You ever heard that said? wants to cover his bases. So he's got a, this new God carved out and is on the shelf with all the other gods. And then he f- gets a little more serious and apparently he cleans off the top shelf and he puts the God of Israel up on the top shelf, but he's got the shelves with all the other gods on it. So he's getting closer to understanding that, well, he's, he's, the, he's the most powerful God but yet he still keeps in mind these others. One of the others that he keeps in mind is himself. He's got this issue of I, which, you know, kind of reminds me of me. And so later on, something happens in King Nebuchadnezzar's life. You know, to become an animal for seven years, that's not... That's not a daily routine, you know? So apparently, it's just, it's just amazing that the reference of King Nebuchadnezzar there in the book of Daniel at the end of chapter 4 is that once his eyes, his reasoning came back to him, he looks up and he sees the God of heaven and acknowledges him as God. And I love it that there's just a big period there. Apparently, the sealing process to awaken the mind of King Nebuchadnezzar has now fully done its work, and he's settled into the fact that the God of heaven is it. The process that's described here in the seven seals is the fact that he is sealing each one of every single human being on this planet. Whatever process it takes to awaken my mind, our minds, to turn us back to the Father, He's going to do that. I definitely do not want to stand here and wish cancer on anybody. I don't want you to experience the loss of a loved one in a car wreck. I don't want you to have to go through anything. Jesus says, just look at the example of my son. Just claim a relationship with him today. Because he wants to use us, like we were talking in Sabbath school, use us to share a testimony of how he's changed my life how he would love to change your life. Because the next section right here, this is all about testimonies. That's what this is all about. And this is Revelation. See if I can squish it up in here. 8, 1, 2. I'm going to leave that blank for a second. Because this section right here 
is called the seven trumpets, okay? Seven T. The seven trumpets. I was challenged. Now, this is about three or four years ago now. He said, this is Bill Liversidge. He challenged me. He says, the biggest key to understand the seven trumpets is actually to figure out where they end. And I'll have to admit, for years, I used to think that the seven trumpets ends at the end of chapter 11 because it's really a beautiful sanctuary scene. You've got different pieces of furniture, and at the end of chapter 11, immediately before chapter 12, all of a sudden, the veil is opened, and we get to see the Ark of the Covenant. And I'm thinking, that's the end of the trumpets. That's pretty cool. And I'm content with my little answer until something hit me. You want to follow along with this logic? This is just amazing. Uh, let's turn to Revelation. Chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8. And let's, verse 13. And I beheld and heard an angel flying in the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet by the three angels which are yet to sound. So here's the key. Here's this little word, woe. So I'm thinking, yeah, this, this is going to be easy. All I got to do is follow through the Bible, find out where the word woe is used, and, and, and done deal. So here I run across it. Here's in Revelation chapter 9, verse 12. One woe is past. Now, by the way, you realize that four trumpets have blown. The fifth one is about to blow in Revelation 9. And at the end, of, here in verse 12, this is eight, uh, 9, verse 12. One woe is past. So the fifth trumpet has now blown, and behold, there comes two more others hereafter. So this is, this is getting easy, isn't it? All we got to do is find the next woe, and we'll know when the sixth trumpet ends, right? So here, here we run across um, Revelation chapter 11, verse 14, and it says, the second woe is past. Oh, man, this is getting to be a no-brainer, isn't it? The, s the sixth trumpet is passed, and what's to happen next? The third woe cometh quickly, or the seventh trumpet cometh quickly. Are you always, is this, is this easy enough? It's just a three-letter word, woe, and, and we're, now we're, all we got to do now is go into the Bible and further on in Revelation, and find out where woe is next, right? Pastor, this is too easy. Well, if you got a King James Version, you're out of luck. The word woe is no longer in the King James Version. If you have like a New American Standard, you'll be cheating today. Somebody called me one time, and they said, do you have a Young's Concordance, a Young's Literal Concordance? And I said, yeah, I got one. And it's about that thick. I could use it as a footstool. You know what I'm saying? Great big old concordance. They said, you need to get it out and look up a particular word. And so I did, and the word that I was told to look up was found in Revelation chapter 18, verse 10. Revelation 18, 10. You know, this is fascinating. This is the most pages I've heard this whole Bible study together. Are y'all doing okay with my book report? Okay, so here, Revelation 18.10. Standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, and, and so on. Oh, by the way, we could even go to verse 16. And saying, alas, alas, or verse 19, saying, alas, alas. In the Young's literal concordance, it takes the word alas, and it's defined as 
Whoa. Now, some of you have some versions. You might be able, you got it? You, got it? you have it there. Yeah, that's cool. So some versions go ahead and change that, which is really easy to determine the fact that here at the end of the seventh trumpet is the last of the trumpets. So we could actually put down here, well, let's just say through chapter 18. How's that? And then over here in this last section, well, that means 18 to the rest of the book would be inside the last parentheses. It's really quite, to me, it's really quite simple. Inside the red brackets, a plan is established. Victory over the evil one. All of heaven is excited about the plan is now established through Jesus. They get excited. The scroll is even handed to Jesus, and the sealing process is explained, even though it's been from the beginning of time, it's explained and now set in place because of the death of God's Lamb. We get excited because we've realized this is all done in Jesus. He's saving even me. Actually, I can even change those words a little bit. He has saved even me. And we get excited about it, and we go and tell the world. Da, 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 da. Little trivia. I know I've shared this before, but it's a reminder, okay? Where's the first use of trumpet in the Bible? Anybody know? First use of the word trumpet in the Bible. Okay, yes. Oh, it's before that. For, what now? Deuteronomy. Where in Deuteronomy? The Feast of Trumpets. Before that? Uh, before Jericho? What now? In heaven? After that. Okay. <laughs> There's stories of things before creation. But the first time of the use of trumpet in the Bible... It has a very unusual description for the word trumpet because God calls the people to meet him at the sound, excuse me, he calls the people to come meet him at Mount Sinai to the voice of a trumpet. The unusual reason why it's being said this way, it doesn't say by the sound of a trumpet, he calls the people to meet him at Mount Sinai. It uses the word there, voice of a trumpet. The reason why we're told this in the story of redemption, that God commissioned the angels to tune their voice to the sound of a trumpet to call the people to meet God. There is nothing different for the purpose of our testimony. In it's time to tell the people of the good news, it's time to meet God. Period. Because, you know how this is so fascinating, because it's a few chapters after that that God gets with Moses and he said, I need you to build a couple silver trumpets. They've never even heard a trumpet on this planet before now. But at least they got to hear what a trumpet sounded like by the angels themselves. They had used ram's horns, yes, but not a trumpet. This is our calling in the last days, to allow the very example of Christ himself, of the relationship that he was living out with his relationship with the Father, that through this wonderful plan that we can be transformed ourselves into having a wonderful relationship with the Father to the point we get excited about it and just have to tell everybody. We cut short the last little bit of this message right here. I'm going to use one verse to prove that point. Turn with me to Revelation 18, verse 4. Here we are right at the very last little bit of the seven trumpets, and we're supposed to be giving this powerful message. 
I'll be honest with you, I used to look at the seven trumpets and consider them and say, this is the most ugliest place in entire Scripture. Why in the world would anyone want to read the seven trumpets? Everything is dying, killed, burned up. But there's a good news message there. I'll share it with you. Because here in Revelation 18.4, I have heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. We're really good at plucking out of Scripture what we want people to hear. Y'all ever heard of people doing that? We love even picking it out of novels or wherever. Heard a sermon just the other day that they plucked out of a, what was that? Something on the internet, a blog. They plucked out of a blog and preached a sermon on somebody's comments on a blog. Well, it blopped up on the screen. I don't, I don't get that. The thing is, we should be standing on the Word of God completely, not just bits and pieces. Because right here, I would be wasting my time to tell somebody, you need to come out of your church. You need to come out of that lifestyle if I'm not giving the rest of the message. The rest of this verse is powerful, just powerful, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. The whole purpose of referring to the plagues, the whole purpose of referring to the beast, the whole purpose of referring to Babylon, the whole purpose of referring to all of the things that have been set up by Satan as deception is that you need not partake of them. The gospel is the foundation of the first chunk of the book. Why do we have to think, well, I want to be sure and let them know what a mess they're in. All I can say is shut up. To God be the glory in Jesus, Amen. not the beast. I don't think we're going to have a class around the tree of life. By the way, I want to make sure y'all got the beast right huh? while y'all were there. No! It's all about Jesus. It's a revelation of Him. It's not a revelation of Satan's deceptions. In fact, our testimony will be all about Jesus. In fact, this is the key. Did I, did I holler too loud? I saw some people do that, so I'm sorry. Okay, this is the key. This is the whole principle behind the seven trumpets. Turn with me to the book of Zechariah. Now, i got to be honest with you. This is, this is the, uh, before we get there, this is the reason I read Revelation the way I, I consider the book. Because the message was given to Jesus by his Father, right? The Father gave the revelation to Jesus. Jesus, in turn, gave it to an angel who, in turn, gave it to John, who, in turn, were supposed to read it, right? If the message came from the Father to Jesus, he would then, in turn, take it to the angel and said, this is the language they would understand. This is the way I talked to them throughout the whole Old Testament. This is the way I referred to them in stories and parables while I was here. And so this is what I told them in Zechariah chapter 13. Now, where is that book, Zechariah? Isn't that the next to the last book in the Old Testament? Okay, Zechariah uh, chapter 13. Let's just pick up here at the end of this chapter, verse 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow. I, I read this verse quite humbly. I want you to know that. It, um, it convicts me every time I read this verse because it says, smite the shepherd and the sheep 
shall be scattered, and I will turn mine hand upon the little ones. Apparently, there are events to take place that your shepherd has to step aside in order for you to learn your own relationship with the Father. Your relationship with Him is not based upon my relationship. But the result of how your relationship is going to be and is established is explained in the next verse. You ready? And it came to pass, then in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die. Now, how many parts? Two parts is cut off. And what's going to happen to that two parts? They're going to perish or die. Okay. But the third shall be left therein. So a third is left therein. And I will bring the third. Now, how how much is he talking about now? The third that's left. Okay. And I will bring the third part through the fire and shall refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. And they shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people. And they shall say, the Lord is my God. So here is an illustration being given that he's going to divide up the people into thirds. Two is going to be set aside. One third he is choosing to go through the fire, and he's in charge of the heat. He's in charge of this fire, and it's called the purifying process that he's going to take our character and refine them. This is the covenant that was read first to us in Scripture in Hebrews, that he will take his law, his character, and put them on our hearts and our minds. So when we go to the seven trumpets... And we read that a third is going to be burned up. Because of the promise here in Zechariah, we really shouldn't think that the third is going to be killed. You're interpreting the fire incorrectly if you think a third is going to die, when actually a third is going to be chosen to be purified. A third is going to be chosen to be drawn closer. And when we hear from each little trumpet that a third is called out, a third is going to be purified, a third is going to be drawn closer, it's like he's saying to Satan himself, you might have taken a third of my angels, but I'm going to take back a third of everybody. In fact, because of the four trumpets that talks about, which doesn't make sense, it's like we're talking about we got a messed up two equal signs, right? God talks about four thirds. You took a third of the angels, I'm going to take back four thirds. Doesn't make sense, does it? We're now talking about the fact that from the example of of the relationship of Jesus. Even Jesus, while on the cross, he had to say, not, or in Gethsemane, not my will, but thine be done. His example is so perfect. We could say that each day of our life. Father, not my will, but thine be done. Yes, that's right. So he, he's claiming them. He's claiming those thirds from different areas across this planet. And the message of the seven trumpets is my testimony that he can take poor, pathetic, wretched, blind, naked Larry Owens and do something with him to the point where I can even indwell this guy. I can indwell my people. 
I can transform them. And he has and is. Because our testimony is that it's time for us to prepare to meet God. Jesus himself has actually lived out the example, we can meet him daily. What was the song, the words in the song that I pointed out? Help me to find the way to bring me back to you. Is that for something in the future? Or do we sing that song for today? This is a daily experience we can claim. Just as Jesus himself claimed that daily experience of his relationship with his father, we should be able to do the same thing. My book report is done. And my hope that you're desiring to hear more good news from a book from years back past has been downright scary. Not filled with hope. But it's all about a revelation of our Savior. May He bless us as we realize this whole book has been for that purpose. This whole book is for that purpose. 190, Jesus loves me. Please stand. Father, thank you so much for your love to send your son to reveal such a beautiful relationship with you, making it possible through his death and resurrection that we can claim the same relationship. May we not take it for granted. May we tell others, Jesus loves me. This I know. This I know. This I know. This is our testimony. May others hear what we know. Is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.